नमस्कार दिस इज सिक्सटी थ्री कृत्या टॉक शो एंड वी हैव नंदनी साहू ए प्रोफेसर पोएट क्रिएटिव राइटर एंड शी इज डूइंग वंडरफुल वर्क शी इज कमिंग विद मिथ विद अ टॉपिक विच इज कॉल्ड मिथ अकॉर्डिंग टू मिथ एंड वॉट इज दैट टॉपिक एक्चुअली Yes. So, yes. Yeah. so this is a important topic, and uh, in traditionally we don't use, uh, but in English it is becoming very popular. So we yes. want to know and learn from her uh, how she is uh, using this myth or uh, mythology, or what is her idea. So welcome, Nandini Sahu. Uh, welcome to this. Kritya talk. You are always so busy. So I know that, but you have taken time for this conversation. This talk is for uh, for learning also. People, students, people can learn. So and you are a professor. So I want to know about first your idea idea about this myth and metaphor. Okay. So may I? Yeah. Please. Okay. So Namaskar. all of you and uh, rati saxena ji thank you so very much for having invited me to this uh, very important uh, poetry movement and very important poetry festival the celebration of poetry that you have been undertaking since long i have been watching you the kind of seminal work you have been doing and uh, you have been discussing on very important issues with poets theorists critics and you have contributed so much to the body of uh, uh, indian literature through this through this kritya poetry movement and i'm so grateful to you for having given me this wonderful opportunity to talk about a subject that is again so dear to me myth as metaphor uh, i feel i'm here in the capacity of uh, not just a, being a professor or a director of a school of uh, foreign languages rather i'm here in the capacity of uh, a, a poet uh, taking myth as her theme in most of the poems i have written and also as a folklorist as a, as a folklorist i think i am here in the capacity of a mythologist and a folklorist and uh, when you invited me to have a dialogue with you on the subject myth of myth as metaphor uh, the first poet who came to my mind was ak ramanujan and uh, uh, he was an expatriate poet and he comes from the uh, and you know uh, he connects the first half of his life uh, in india so well through myth and metaphor and folklore that nostalgia dominates the second half of his life and ek uh, ramanujan i am just quoting him a little before uh, before i go to my poetry he says that english and uh, my uh, discipline linguistics and anthropology give me my outer forms linguistic metrical logical and other such ways of shaping experiences and my first 30 years in india my frequent visits and field trips my personal and professional preoccupations with kannada tamil and classics and folklore give me my substance my inner forms images and symbols they are continuous with each other and i no longer can tell what comes from where so this is the case with me that uh, i connect so well with indian mythology and folklore that i really do not know who comes from what the poet in me the folklorist in me the critic in me the creative writer the theorist all my identities will come together and one identity in me completes the other you know sometimes ramanujan is highly critical witty and ironical Uh, uh about the many aspects uh, of the hindu heritage while he recollects about his life in india uh, uh the, in the poem the hindu he doesn't uh, hurt a fly or a spider either he criticizes the hindu for whom non violence uh, and uh, you know all being laid back are all the same and uh, very satirically he writes that it's time i told you why i am so gentle i do not hurt a fly 
So this kind of poetry he has written. And uh, I belong to that historiography in Indian poetry. I have been so influenced by the great masters uh, of Indian poetry like A.K. Ramanujan and R. Partha Sarathi, Jayant Mahapatra and Kamala Das, his musical and those kind of poets. Uh, my poetry is an outcome of the dialectical interplay of my childhood and adult experiences on the one hand and my sense of self and uh, my present experiences on the other. So these things come together in my poetry. And, uh, you know, uh, at my past with nostalgia, satirically celebrating my liberation from and assertion of my multiculturalism, my pluralism. And I also look skeptically at my new homeland and uh, uh, as an outsider with a feeling of something having been lost in the process of growth. I definitely am growing every single day, but the things that I am losing, they keep haunting me. They keep following me. And, uh, you know, I make, uh, I, I'm so close to my Odisha background. I'm basically from Odisha, living in Delhi since last 14 years. So my Odisha background come to me in complex ways of my poetry, through my poetry. And, uh, uh, and you know, the composite structure of family life, my past, and uh, you know the serenity of uh, the and the closeness of the bonds, which which I have with my past, with my Odisha landscape, they come to my poetry, returning to my native soil, like any other immigrant poet living in Delhi, coming from Odisha, I initiate a process of rediscovery of myself in myth. Myth is my panacea. I struggle in my poetry to reintegrate myself with my past and present experiences. And then I settle down with myth and folklore. My uh, Nandini, uh, yeah. Nandini uh, I just uh, want to interfere. Uh, yes. You talk about your journey. It's fine. Yes. We, uh, I want to know, this, why don't we decode the subject so that our audience can understand well. When we okay. talk about myth, what do you mean by myth? And, uh, okay. You are saying the folklore, I understand. Yes. Folklore is yes. uh, uh, sometimes there is myth in a folklore and sometimes right. it is just folklore. Now, yes. when we uh, when we talk about myth, for, for I will say that mythology. So yes. which what kind of mythology you are following? As you okay. said that, uh, one minute, as you said that you belong to Odisha and yes. Odisha is following a kind of mythology which yes. is uh, which comes from the uh, Vaishnav Sampraday they are following, yes. which is very common there. Uh, yes. I'm, uh, so uh, when you talk about mythology, what is your idea about the mythology and myth and why are you following those? So please talk about that. Okay, yeah, that is exactly what uh, Ratiji I was coming to. You know, uh, the modern poets, the contemporary poets, like the great masters of English literature, look at W. B. Yeats, look at T. S. Eliot, and look at our Indian poets like Ramanujan and Parthasarathy. They use a typical genre which uh, is critically called mythopoeia, M. Y. T. H. O. P. O. E. I. A. Mythopoeia, which means you know it's a narrative genre in modern literature. Uh, and film where uh, a fictional or um, a fictional mythology is created by the writer uh, of prose or poetry or any such genre. So, you know, myth is an answer to a lot of existential debates in me. Sometimes when I struggle between a paradisal past and a present where so many identities are coming to me, so many existential challenges are coming to me. I need to settle down. I need to create an identity of my own. I need to belong somewhere. And that belongingness, that sense of belonging comes to me through use of mythology and folklore. I'll give you multiple examples of my poetry. For example, since my childhood, I had been reading a lot of you know, folk Ramayans and also classical Ramayans. And there were storytelling sessions at home where my grandmother used to tell us stories from Ramayana and she would try to justify a lot of things. 
why Lord Ram left Sita in the forest. She would justify in her own beautiful way. But again, a lot of questions used to come to my mind. And those questions, I grew up with those. And now at this mature stage of my life, when I know how to you know, present myself through poetic language, how to articulate, how to express my thoughts and feelings, I think I put all those things together and I created a long poem like Sita. So uh, this is the book about which I have been uh, telling you. Uh, Sita is a complete poem. It's a long poem in 25 cantos where I'm presenting, I'm deconstructing, decoding, like you use the word decode, I'm taking from you. I'm deconstructing the character Sita from Ramayan, uh, a very progressive, independent, optimistic, contemporary, very positive character Sita who doesn't brood or cry over destiny. Rather, she uses whatever life gives her in her stride. She is an educationist. She educates the students in the Valmiki ashram when she is left alone. She is a great cook. She is a provider. She is like Mother Earth. She is a great cook. And then she is a healer. And she is a single mother of Love Kush. See, Love Kush are known as Sita Putra, not as Ram Putra. And a single mother being so strong, independent and positive without brooding, complaining, crying. This is what I see in all of us as contemporary women. We do not brood or cry over destiny. We don't have the time for that. We are so engaged in a dialogue with life. We are so engaged with positive thoughts, positive activities, contributing to enrich the society that we really do not have the time to brood, complain and cry. So I see so Sitanas in you when you do the Kritya movement. Kritya movement is your protest literature. You are protesting in a beautiful, subdued, poetic way through the Kritya movement. And my protest literature, my social mobility literature is use of myth and folklore. Last week only you might have read in the Indian Express that I designed a complete MA program in folklore and culture studies, which will be the first of this kind in India with complete study material for my university, the first year course is offered, the second year courses are under process. And yesterday I had the experts committee meetings and designed the syllabus. So this is my way of using myth and folklore. And you know, I really do not go by what people call mainstream. In Indian universities, in academia, when you see it, look at the English departments, you will see that the mainstream literatures are basically British or American literatures. I'm definitely into mainstream. I teach a lot of British literature, a lot of American literature, but then my social commitment is folklore. My social commitment is myth. So this is what I mean by myth, that enriching our civilization, giving an, an exposure to marginal studies like myth and folklore, bringing myth and folklore to the table, using myth and folklore as a part of our curriculum, and then writing poetry. In the beginning itself, I said, that the poet in me that, and the creative writer in me and the teacher in Nandini cannot be separated. One identity comes from the other. So this is what I mean by use of myths. Now, I belong to that historiography of Indian poetry where A.K. Ramanujan and R. Parthasarathy, uh, they talked about use of myth and use of, you know, the past, the, ro the roots. We have to look at our roots. And uh, I make use of uh, my audition background, as I already told you. And before I go to my magnum office, my most important poem, epic poem, Sita, if you pardon me, uh, about which there is so much of uh, deliberation in academia. A lot of research is going into this book, Sita. And people are talking about Sita as an eco-feministic poem, a feministic poem dealing with ecology, and a poem of ecology dealing with feministic thoughts. The two identities again coming together in the poem Sita. Uh, but I would like to uh, recite a couple of my very sure. old poems uh, where I am using uh, myth, Indian mythology, as you know my background. In fact, uh, to me, each poem I have written is a story in verse, story in poetry. Each poem is a story for me. I want to tell a story. I'm a great storyteller, I believe. But then I also know how to create stories in the form of poetry. So uh, one of my very old poems, the title of the poem is The Mother. I wrote that on Durga Puja, the Shera, for the goddess. O mother of the earth, come down with your gaiety 
and make us mortals feel your immortal presence. Your auspicious hour has come. O human creator, O killer of sin, O maker of the universe, O sculptor deity, O the commotion, O all embracing power, O Shakti, come down. Come down, O mother, pour life into the lifeless. And it's a very long poem. Uh, so I am kind of inviting the mother goddess, the most powerful goddess mother, to come to us, to redeem us, to give us power. And then, uh, you know, yes, poem. when I talked about my tradition background, Lord Jagannath, Jagannath Puri, I use Jagannath myth in some of my poems. In one of my poems, the title of the poem is Lord Jagannath, a god without limbs. You know, Lord Jagannath's body, you might have seen uh, the photograph and my background. You can see his body is incomplete. His hands are up to this and he doesn't have legs. And his skin color is completely dark, ogling, very round, big, big eyes he has. So imagine a human being with all these physical attributes. People will say that this person is ugly. This person doesn't have limbs, incomplete. This person is completely dark skinned, general common people might say that. But Lord Jagannath is giving a very beautiful ecological face to the society through that presentation. The Lord of the universe, the, the supreme power, the one who has created this beautiful universe has incomplete lips. So he is giving a message that the physically challenged cannot be looked down upon. The physical ch physically challenged person the disabled, the so-called disabled person can be supremely powerful. It's about how you look at that person. So that is the message. And Lord Jagannath has another message, the dark skin. People talk a lot about fairness and beauty coming together. But Lord Jagannath gives this message that the dark skin can be most beautiful. So he talks about inclusivity of all skin colors, all castes, all kinds of physical attributes. People who are so-called disabled, people who are incomplete physically, and people who are dark-skinned, inclusivity of all of them. So with that thing in my mind, I have written quite a few Lord Jagannath poems on Jagannath cult. So people who are listening to me out there may Google a little bit about Jagannath cult. They will know about the Akshay Patra, the never-ending food, Akshay Patra, and also the skin color the limbs of Lord Jagannath. They can also read about Jagannath cult. One of my poems uh, on Odisha and landscape, where again, I'm using myth as metaphor. Jagannath myth as metaphor I'm using in this poem. So uh, I will just recite the poem for you, if you permit. I may go on voting perpetual. There would be gray hairs on my head. More gray hairs, while I would be humming tunes to the Odisha landscape. Sprawling, relaxed, and really morning on the downy corners of my lawn. I am suckling my youth, bathing in the new suns shining on daily new skies. Here in Delhi, where darkness divine too late and the cock crow dawns too early here in Delhi. I am wishful about the glow, the glow of Odishan landscape. There is the glow I saw on the banks of River Daya, where Chanda Shoka turned into Dharma Shoka. Ashoka, the Sun Temple reminds us of Dharma, the paragon of glory, Puri Temple, where Lord Jagannath, the loveliest, ugliest, eternal wizard, would entice you to fall in love with him, soul to soul. Gopalpur on sea, where the sun and the sand play hide and seek. With the lusty foam and waves, the glow of the bat kiln, the fire fragrance of emancipation unfurling, the ascent to glory and descent to poverty, cyclones, droughts, sharp toothed, disastrous nature, her blood bubbling to match. To, to snatch mother's breasts from the milk-mouthed kids. 
during floods and storms, hunger and catastrophe become a way of life. Each inundation render the land infertile for years, yet nothing, nothing can ever seize the glow of Odisha. Odisha landscape does know how to fill your nostrils with smells, aroma of life, vegetation, rice and fish curry, spinach fry, a kitchen full of food and life full of life. The inkling is to live and let live. Here the, sto the storm god is gleeful, the sun god a glow. The scent soiled air loves to flow through cruel chilled mug and scorching Vaishak. Here time celebrates life in the village, bonfire chit chats, gossips in local dialects, in the aroma of puffed rice, mustard oil, chopped onions, watered rice, brinjal fry at home and hearth, idli, puri, uriya, street food, sambal puri saris, and homemade pickles with the fragrance of love, red ants patrol the walls, rats patrol the underground granites with grains and the smell of flora and fauna everywhere. Smoke rises off the roofs day in and day out. No one would, would go hungry from an Odia household. Even the poorest of the poor, the Akshapatra of Goddess Lakshmi looms large here. Drops of the poor blood beam in the yellow harvest to some stomach's content and heart's benefit. Odisha, the melting pot of cultures, the meeting point of the East and the West. In Odisha, like a bee, I tried to gather honey of a lifetime. One day, that day, in poet Jayant Mahapatra's little study, I met Mahapatra, the spirit of Odisha. In his study with his Cleopatra like beautiful late wife's photographs smiling from the wall, each of his eyes, each of her eyes, an ode, her smile, a lyric, her silence, an epic, the woman on a divine agenda. Odisha, here is love, here is hope, happiness amid all pain, and nemesis amid injustice, and truth amid falsehood. Here, stone sinks to stone, he speaks to see, see, away from the glue, from life's ebb and flow, from love's full-fledged show, my mind is vacuum like air inside a football, empty people in, at present sink from memories empty hangers in hearts heavy chambers. So this is how the poem goes on, how nostalgia and myth Control, dominate my poetry. I take out ideas from Jagannath cult, Jagannath metaphor, Jagannath myth, and then I use those in my social mobility poetry and literature. Thank you. This is a, a different kind of uh, explanation yes. what I, uh, than what I was expecting. Anyway, this was a good but, thing that one thing that you are uh, talking about your land, you're talking about yes. your. Uh, uh, myths around uh, which are very popular in Odisha in your culture, in your presentation and I know that uh, because Odisha culture is quite rich and uh, you are bringing those uh, 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 smell, yeah. I mean the food smell, the smell of uh, prasadam, smell of uh, the land, smell of the mud in your poetry, that is fantastic thing. And, I use uh, a lot of smell mm -hmm. images dominate me yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. And uh, yeah. second thing, as you say that, you're not worrying about the mainstream uh, uh, poetry uh, as it was popular. Now, I don't think it is popular very much in it because many are writing uh, poetry, but they are connecting to their land. Uh, and there was a popular that you write in a mainstream uh, means that yeah. Western style. Because I remember uh, uh, Dr. Ayapa Ponikar who used to start uh, asking was not now uh, uh, almost 30 years back he was asking his students uh, to take the phd subject um, yeah. uh, on the uh, based on their own uh, literature compared to yeah. western literature or something like this so that uh, that's you are doing a, a, a work 
uh, very uh, which is here your myths are metaphor yeah. for your poetry yeah i am talking as a in a general uh, mm -hmm. what you said that i could understand very well that you have mm -hmm. converted sita uh, or you have taken the sita as a myth and then you have taken as a metaphor metaphor it is always easy when we use myth as a metaphor because those uh, these memories are always there in uh, audience or in the people who read or in a common people even so uh, that is how we use myth but the problem is that uh, there are many myths which are used and reused many many times for example these two uh, uh, these uh, two books what we say that sanskrit uh, epics we call it sanskrit epics they are not really story as a sanskrit student for me they are epics they are already created for the for a purpose so this ramayana is a story uh, based on some uh, they have used some kings name and all but they are story for their culture for the society of that time mahabharat is little different but we have used many times these stories and luckily or uh, unfortunately these uh, stories are uh, already uh, taken place or in a reused or rewritten in many indian languages for example that we have kamban ramayana we have uh, uh, in kerala also one ramayana huh? so they are, there are many uh, ramayanas are there and they uh, and you may also have like and especially like a geeta govinda is very different odia this this geeta govinda is very different from uh, surdas krishna and radha or uh, from uh, uh, from uh, uh, tulsidas uh, not tulsidas is talking only of uh, uh, geeta but geeta govinda uh, the krishna and radha is different than surdas is different than meera is different than other things so mm -hmm. uh myth here the myth is already multiplied in mm -hmm. many many forms mm -hmm. uh what i feel that you are still stick to your own land your own smell and that is good mm -hmm. also because you should not forget you have to show your face and that you are showing even though you are uh, physically living in delhi far from your land but yes you are connecting your literature you writing with your own land mm -hmm. that is fantastic right. yeah uh, my question is this that uh, do you uh, just follow the the, uh, the what you say that uh, things or uh, you uh, go deep in the reading in the mythology myths also okay. uh -huh. because uh, because what happened i uh, i saw one uh, uh, poet in kerala who got award for her poetry she was she might have written wonderful poetry and she has mm -hmm. taken a myth of draupadi uh, mm -hmm. or uh, uh, draupadi in her i think mm -hmm. draupadi only she has taken it and uh, mm -hmm. she said that she has followed uh, local uh, some poems even she has followed the dharmveer bharti's hindi also and many other stories like and i asked her mm -hmm. did do you read mahabharata did you read she said no because it is difficult it is in sanskrit so mm -hmm. I, i felt that if she could read mahabharata in a in a proper way uh, mm -hmm. through uh, through tika or through translation it would mm -hmm. expand her idea so what is your way to write how to how you use this like uh, some myths are very ready for you because this style is very much uh, popular in odisha then uh, uh, jagannath is very popular so these are in your blood but right, suppose yeah. you take a new new myth so how do you take new myth okay yeah thank you so much you know you have a point you really asked the question that i wanted you to ask uh, so a lot of people look at myth very simplistically using reusing telling retelling the stories from the myth but what i understand by myth as metaphor is uh, you know problematizing the social issues the contemporary issues 
through the issues in Indian mythology in mm -hmm. any kind of myth. So deconstructing, decoding myth, using those for the benefit of our contemporary issues and challenges, problems in the society and getting the solutions from myth and you know using myth for the, the progress, the development of the society. So, uh, so with that in my mind, I write, I use myth as a part of my literature. See, uh, from that, from my Odishan identity, now I will talk about my pan-Indian identity through a couple of my uh, mythical poems. My most recent poetry collection uh, was Zero Point. The name of my book was Zero Point. It's a poetry book. In fact, I have named my new house also as Zero Point. Zero Point is the point from where you start life. You begin a new life from zero point. And zero shunya is a concept from the Upanishads. So even I use, I get ideas from the Upanishads, the Vedas, Bhagavad, and Gita and everything. And uh, you know, the very idea behind the title of my book, Zero Point, is Upanishadic, as I said. Zero point starts when life comes to a full circle. When you feel that you are complete, you are fulfilled. So when life comes to a full circle, it's a new beginning. The inclusive, compassionate, universal, tolerant, accommodative, and patient. This is what you we, I understand by the myth of zero in the Upanishad. Inclusive, your pleasure, compassionate, your pleasure, universal, you find tolerant, and accommodative, and patient. That is the idea of zero in, in Upanishad. Zero includes all the numbers. Which number, which Upanishad you find zero? I can't hear you. Uh, which Upanishad you find zero? Which Upanishad? Uh, okay, can you fine. Huh, so, you know, it's, huh. it's, it's a very general idea. In the, the idea no, of the, zero. No, that is Purnam, not Shunyam. Shunya is a Bodha. Shun, okay. Purnam, uh, Shunya is not there in Upanishad. Huh? Okay. Purnam okay. idam Purnam adha Purnad Purnam Udhichyate. This is mm -hmm. Upanishad. Purnam. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because Purnam is zero. So mostly okay. when when people translate into other languages, mm -hmm. like uh, English, when they translate, mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. translate it as a zero, which is not mm -hmm. a right translation. And you are an English professor, so you might have mm -hmm. learned that. But it is Purnam. Fullness. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. But the fullness and the Shunya. But same mm -hmm. thing. Bodhism mm -hmm. has taken Shunya. Mm -hmm. Shunya okay. again is the, uh, the combination of fullness mm -hmm. and emptiness. Okay. 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 So okay. these so are the two point, things. Uh, uh, these yes, two so in things this book, zero point, I am uh, using the idea of zero as completeness. Something that completes you, the beginning and the end. Yeah. The completion so, of your yeah. life. So zero here is Purnam. When you yeah. say that okay. your house mm -hmm. When you use mm -hmm. uh, zero point is mm -hmm. in Sanskrit uh, in a in a Upanishadic translation we may okay. say Purnam point. Okay. Yes. So you know the, the <laughs> idea of the poem is the completion, the completeness. Yeah. When life comes yeah. to a full circle, yeah. you feel yeah, complete. Yeah. So this yeah, exactly yeah. is the idea of the book zero point. Yeah. Even if I am beginning life from that zero point, but it, mm. it represents my completeness as a woman. My completeness as a, as a human being, when I am forgiving, I am accepting, and I am more inclusive. So this is what I mean by zero point in that. And also in some of my poems, my poetry collections, uh, this is an uh, an un, uh, this is an unpublished poem. Now it's going to come in the next collection. The title of the poem is Letter to My Unborn Daughter. So uh, this poem is about uh, a girl child whom I lost before 20 years. Uh, to some some kind of violence. I lost the girl child. And now after 19 years, I had the courage, I had the conviction that I can write a letter to my unborn daughter. That and is... even here, it's a very personal narrative. But I wanted to make it universal. You know, this is the contribution of literature, that we can use the narratives from myth, in my case, and sometimes people use social narratives, but they take out their personal happinesses, their sorrows. So this is one poem like that, where I am writing a letter to my unborn daughter. And uh, the poem goes like this. Tiny limbs smeared with my fresh and flamed blood, oozing out of the womb, 
Blessing, in fact, I knew I had lost you. So I'm writing a letter to the girl, unborn daughter. Then and there, shattered. The sadomasochist burped and then casually farted and snored in a short while. When the maid rushed us to the local hospital, I heard what you never uttered. Ah, healers, protectors, you and me, me and me and you, mom and a little girly, wish to take the world in that stride. Today, a letter to you, my unborn daughter, after long two decades of quiet travel, telling our tales to your younger brother, with a bleeding heart, I smile with exuding tears. Smile to see my dream daughter alive in her brother, little, so full of love and compassion, so much a feminist, humanist male, so strong to hold mom's head high, so much you, so as I would have had you, would have had you. Ah, there is such race over a female fetus, growing up to be a girl of power and conviction like mother dear, or like the Pancha Mahakanyas. So here I'm asking my girl child to come back to me with all the powers, all the qualities of the Pancha Mahakanyas, the marital rapes, the threats to snatch you any given day if I dissent and then the termination. If at all there is a next birth for you, my little fairy, come back, come back to my life. Life minus is you is so dreary. You need not play the game that the heart must play. Pronounce before birth, you are not going to be the woman of clay. Like Ahilya. So I'm using the myths of Ahilya. Never fall prey to Indra's trickery. And if ever you do, do it by your choice, not by anyone else's. Neither Gautamas nor Indra's. Your penance need not be broken by Lord Rama. The one who judged his wife, you need not regain your human form. By brushing his feet, remain the dry stream, the stone, till you find a way to my life again in another life, another yug. You need not be condoned of your guilt. You never were guilty. Let Indra be cursed, concealed by a thousand valve that eventually turn into a thousand eyes. Or like Draupadi, take your birth from a fire sacrifice, be an incarnation of the goddess Kali or the goddess of wealth, Lakshmi, but never be the sacrificial goat to accept five husbands just because someone else deliberated. If an Yudhishthir drops you at the Himalayas because you loved Arjun more, look in his eyes and declare loud and clear, it's your right to live love and free. While never deriding the Duryodhan and the kern of your destiny live laudable, my dear, nor Kunti be your role model. <coughs> but if ever you propitiate the sage Durvasha, who grants you a mantra to summon a god and have a child by him, then take his charge. Don't you recklessly test the boons that life grants you by his, nor invite the sun god Surya give birth to Karna and abandon. An unborn child is better than the the dejected for loan. If ever you are Tara, the Apshara, the celestial nymph who rises from churning of the milky ocean, be the Tara, Sugrip's queen and chief diplomat, the politically correct one, the woman in control of herself and folks around. In the folk Ramayans, Tara casts a curse on Ram by the supremacy of her chastity, while in some versions, Ram enlightens Tara. Be her the absolute, or be Mandodari, the beautiful, pious, the righteous, Ravan's dutiful wife, who couldn't be his guiding force, Vivisan's, Vivisan's compliant wife, the indomitable grace. Be you the elemental, candid, real woman who is my ideal. Don't ever let another female fetus be the victim of sadomasochism, unlike your fragile, fledging mom. Be all that she could never be. Be her role model. I send you my prayers, the prayer before birth, moon, rain, oceans, and the blue firmament, shining tears, and the sun aglow are all that I have. You must call them your own, my unborn daughter. Forgive me, my love, for you, for you died with all the petals falling from my autumnal breast, the breast that you could never suckle. You rain on my being and burn my heart. But come, my soul, like simmering snow, slowly concealed yet revealed. You will stay indomitable, 
taking new lives every single day in mom's prayers poetry social responsibilities ecofeminism messages voices layers of thoughts and action my girl i am what i am to be i decided to be after losing you that is the euphemism i am not just a woman since that fateful night but entire woman kind now i am a woman of full circle within me there is the power to create nurture and transform i rediscover pieces of myself through your unburned narrative in the resonance of my confluence so this is how i am using the pancha mahakanyas the myth of the pancha mahakanyas to recreate the girl who made me the strong woman that i am today so this is how i am using the characters the pancha mahakanyas from myth and the best attributes of their characters should be in my girl but i am trying to say it that should be in all women yeah i understand that uh, how you are using uh, myth uh, and uh, in your poetry and uh, here actually the in this very starting if you could use some myth of uh, uh, that uh, the, the girl uh, you know that uh, in the uh, the sister of krishna uh, yeah. because he is his sister was also killed by uh, his uncle no yeah you know that uh, that uh, mahabharata myth that could be used because it was kill this killing of a girl and that girl became the thunder that right. could be also used but yes i understand that how you are using myth and mythology so uh, uh, so that uh, what i understand well that uh, you use the myth as a metaphor in right. most of uh, most of the poems and yeah. you are using myth and metaphor for a purpose means yes for a purpose, using, uh, purpose. For, for a purpose that is the whole purpose yeah yes because uh, you are not just glorifying them yes. you are telling them you are giving a you are giving a information or giving a giving actually asking young generation or women to what are the good qualities one should accept because i i like it that you said that Yeah, you like uh, you. You're not talking as Sita as a as a, uh, a, a as a, a woman who is crying that her pa- husband has thrown out. Uh, but you are asking and you are seeing a teacher in a Sita, an eco friendly yeah. eco friendly teacher, and uh, she are seeing a cook. You are seeing yeah. a, a, a a a beauty lover. so these things the, the see uh, sita as a cook is very trusting so yes, yes. This, this is a great cook a great cook so these are the things uh, which are actually as a metaphor you are using yes. in a very right way and right uh, uh, for uh, for a well being of the society or for your it means your poetry is giving message which is very good and it is yes. reachable also but sometimes yes. there could be problem uh, i'm mm-hmm. just asking because you are mm-hmm. an english writer yeah. and yes. your poetry yes. can uh, get published in a, a western or european journals also i now i these i know that many people know about me but for all many because you are using many myth so you might mm-hmm. have given many notes good notes is it yeah <laughs> yes. that is <laughs> what i do Yeah, in uh, such cases what i do like uh, my book sita which i told you that is also in the uh, in the uh, ma english syllabi of a couple of foreign universities not just okay. indian universities are teaching uh-huh. sita rather uh-huh. some uh, uh, foreign universities are also teaching sita because they understand sita as uh, an epitome of indian womanhood the way i have narrated sita deconstructed and narrated sita they mm-hmm. understand that the indian women are like this this bold mm-hmm. contemporary progressive and independent so uh, for that matter you know i think i should recite a few lines for you from sita uh, mm-hmm. from uh, so sita is my witness literature mm-hmm. nadin godimer in her uh, novel prize speech she said that uh, uh, i want to i write i write witness literature mm-hmm. in the court of law the witness plays a very important role a very major role mm-hmm. similarly in a social change in the process of social change a poet plays an important role the role of a witness 
so that i call my social mobility literature and my witness literature and see that is that kind of a text where i am talking about so many issues i am questioning even myself if i am sita i am questioning myself why did a woman like me who is so contemporary so modern and so so very well read believe in a golden deer nature will never produce a golden deer but i still believe in that golden deer and i created this kind of a predicament for myself that could have been avoided so self questioning is also there and i am questioning the entire society i am leaving it open ended the poem is very open ended uh, so uh, you know the, a few lines like from canto 1 i will read just a few lines for you call her what you may sita janaki vaidehi rama she is woman w capital she is woman she is every woman the propagated interpolated role model the woman who adopted a self imposed exile the woman whom life time and again find and patriarchy find safe to evict in her emancipated consciousness she never had been reticent never given up come back she has from the segments of mother earth to live in me to live in you in the mass consciousness of the universe she is there since the commencement of timeless history since the unwritten agenda of the society prevails to define me you or her in altered forms and repudiations sita lives in the sitapur rampur udaipur of india she is on the internet in tv in daily soaps in households universities streets call centers in temples and churches in silon in the backwaters of kerala in your concealed perception and in the indian constitution she is the erstwhile women prime minister of india and the women president the multitasking working mother and the homemaker the gang raped girl in delhi bus at night and the battered baby girl in the aims trauma center she is in the hot helpless tears of the poor in the hidden fears yet again she is the confident adamant stalwart new woman resilient as the pegasus sita sati sita she is not just the hypothetical or the historical substance of academics she is truly animated to this living present living she is pertinent she is the past and the present she is the comprehensive social political and religious attitude of the progressive indian woman the one who suffers and succeeds but never regresses i am the new woman can i be constituted correctly without your understanding of sita can your collective faith in me get pronounced without deconstructing sita can your sympathy empathy inquisitiveness about the fractured identities of us the women of the world of this earth and here be lessened without deliberating the anguished formal portrait of sita sita the woman who translates the communal and the cloistered cosmoses in the society controls remotely the kinship and the exile of ram creates the realization of the ethics of banishment liability assertion loyalty and denunciation hence this story in verse that's why i wrote this poem sita and you know uh, uh, sita talks about her ichha mrityu and she talks about her being a woman of conviction and she talks about what are the responsibility the social responsibilities that she had to undertake and uh, sita uh, very often people ask me questions is sita academic poetry like you just asked me that you are a professor of english so i have asked this question time and again is sita an academic poetry you know in this uh, contemporary culture of distraction like i'm i'm quoting munro it's a long standing divisive space between theory and poetry and that you know that com- that division between theory and poetry is thinning down day by day after all a contemporary poet doesn't live in a singular world totally cut off from the currents of ideas and information that keep penetrating and invading the most intimate and private recesses of his or herself in such a scenario of intellectual information explosion poetry far from being a simply an intuitive response to immediate living reality it also measures and it tends to be a response to the theory contemporary theories and this poetry theory symbiosis is so much in me as a poet and uh, you may ask 
is nandini the mother the maker of sita uh, is a poet of her community or it's a poet of the institution and university my answer would be this is my dual identity i am a poet of the university i am a university poet and at the same time i am a poet i am a poet of ecology with a lot of ecological consciousness by using tools and concepts from the latest theories of post colonialism post structuralism new historicism and cultural materialism cultural poetics i undertake a rigorous analysis of sita in terms of its shifting locations multi stranded intertextuality is there polyphony is there in the text sita and uh, the cantos that i create in sita each canto is an independent poem you can read those independently also of course there is continuity between the 25 cantos the stories the ramayan the story of ramayan so many folk ramayans is told in the in the text in poetic language there is continuity and uh, the proximity of sita uh, links to folk narrative mostly to mythical and to folk narratives and uh, do i i question myself do i use these narratives to generate some kind of post modernist intertextuality this question is asked to me several times uh, by the critics who are teaching this poem that are you creating some kind of intertextuality through this poem and i think yes i am creating intertextuality through this poem theory overtakes my poetry and my poetry overtakes my theory classes quite visibly and without any camouflage i have been using those and you know uh, it is not simple that uh that fuko and uh, the the theories like uh, the events of history its jolts its surprises and its victories and its defeats they all come in the poetry of a university poet who has been using myth as metaphor and uh, it's not easy it's very very challenging like you said that too much use of myth can be very simplistic in your approach to poetry but if you use myth with a purpose like once again you said i am only quoting you that using myth as with a purpose myth as metaphor with a purpose to create some kind of mobility and narrative in the society then probably we are solving the purpose and uh, my aim is not to establish an easy one to one correspondence between my poetry and my post modernist theories rather i once again try to create a distinctive identity of both though they always come together but still i try to create a distinctive identity and i think kritya poetry movement that you have been doing is uh, nothing but uh, poetry as protest and poetry as movement and uh, poetry as uh, as metaphor oh it is nice uh, that uh, i understand that you are uh, your sita poem I, i am also impressed by this mm-hmm. because uh, this is a very different it is yeah. your sita is not crying it's not a yeah. weak woman uh, one yeah. thing i yeah. like that your sita is very strong woman which yeah. we make mistake and which irritates me also that how long you cry on the sita and dropadi i feel yeah. they both were both were very strong women so that uh, i uh, like and how you use myth or convert use the myth in a post modernism is also very interesting because your the sita is there in a girl who ra- got raped in a bus at uh, 10 o'clock a night at uh, so these things are also very strong images which are uh, a new approach so uh, i like it very much and uh, this is very different so here we talk about the myth as metaphor in your poetry and uh, in general do you want to say something more yeah if you give me another 2 to 3 minutes i will no, just conclude you take okay. you take uh, you take your time you take your okay, time okay. no. i'll just take another 2 to 3 minutes since i see that it's always almost going to be 7 8 uh, so you know uh, i did 2 uh, years of research before i wrote this poem this long poem sita i traveled all the uh, i traveled through the ramayana map of the world not just india i visited so many countries i went to nepal indonesia bali and also i i went to sri lanka and all those places where there is some ramayana connection and uh, i lived in the ramayana for two years i i took wow. interviews with quite a few people who have been doing research on the ramayana i took interviews i discussed with them i took notes with them from them and then i gave also i have given credit to them in my 
preface the long introduction that i have written with the western audiences they read it like uh, you just asked me that western readers how do they read it so those interviews that discuss in that long 8 to 10 pages introduction that i have written the the interviews i have taken with people that probably helps the western readers to understand my sita objectively as a woman even my western readers they identify themselves with sita they understand what i am trying to say to sita and they also see some kind of sitaness in themselves as this word sitaness uh, maybe i coined it and uh, they see themselves in sita they see sita in them so uh, the independent and the progressive woman who takes life in her stride so with this i will just read a small part of canto 25 in it's a very long canto and in canto 25 she is talking sita after she goes back to planet to mother earth from there she is sending a kind of monologue to her lord ram and she is asking him that you may not consider me as a as a wife but you can you should consider me and love kush as citizens of ram rajya you are maryada purushottam and we three people were citizens of your country so you had at least that responsibility to find out what happened to a pregnant woman when she was left alone in the forest that is my basic right as a citizen of your country so here she talks about the political debate you know she talks about the cultural debates the political debates and that purity and pollution debate already going in the mind of lord ram when he asked lakshman to leave her in the forest so here she is offering sisterhood this is a poem of sisterhood she is offering that sisterhood to all women and she is telling them if you are deserted some day for no fault of yours yours then you should what you should do that i am writing in the canto 25 uh, i am taking it from the middle of canto 25 i had the courage and conviction to exercise my freedom to choose a life of a docile wife or death by choice of a stubborn woman i took ichha mrityu like vishma in the mahabharat she refers to vishma in the mahabharat that i took ichha mrityu by going back to mother earth after fulfilling all my responsibilities and denying to live with a disrespectful husband i need i used my admirable cognizance to withstand subsist and finally rise above my anguish what else is freedom she talks about freedom that i took ichha mrityu ichha life so what else is freedom with freedom i exude the sparkle concomitant with mystical holiness with freedom i made an assortment to culminate the cycle of torments exceeded the parameters of history i am born again and again baptized by different names going back to mother earth by choice i became immortal i entered mm-hmm. her deathless encirclement oh mother earth i swear i shall take birth again and again and in every birth i will be the free spirited contemporary enlightened woman for i am the manifestation of freedom oh ram my esteemed husband for life i may be your ultimate love and dedication but you rescued your pride not me from ravan thus sita may be your muse eternal but think twice you will get the loyalty of the real sita the day you no more demand her to be loyal i repeat sita may be your muse eternal but think twice you will get the loyalty quote and quote loyalty of the real sita the day you no more demand her to be loyal i might be forced to believe that life that life second that the second exile was due to public opinion but you can justify but you can justify the reason why did you ask me for the first fire test in lanka or ram wasn't the purity pollution question already there in your mind since the day i was adopted so your so you accepted me back wasn't the commitment of the washerman later on in ayodhya just an imploration for you to do what you always believed o ram wasn't it just the way out to reject me by putting the responsibility on public opinion wasn't it a plea but then you might not have banned me as a spouse but as a queen with regard to public estimations i banned you from my life as a husband who failed in his duties to life and to wife and children the world still 
does debate about Sita's purity and pollution. By contrast, Sita's silent living, uh, living out life as doled out to her minus enormous arguments speaks her conviction. Your rejection of Sita is comprehensively judged by the world as unacceptable, but my rejection of Ram is believed as an illustration of highest dignity of a just woman. This is my poem, listed, unembellished, ironical, engaging my personal notion of the lives of women, all women. It is redolent, delineated within the uncontrolled brevity of the woman who knows exactly when, where, and what to do when striking philosophies are controlling women, since I am candid as the west wind and the twilight charcoal. Women, don't be intrigued by the questions patriarchal. Comprehend and accomplish the kinetic dichotomies of life. I offer you my reciprocal sisterhood universal. So I am offering universal sisterhood to all women through this long poem. So this is wonderful. I Now, uh, Sita, you have actually taught, uh, you reuse this myth in a many way and very beautiful ways. What is your next uh, idea that what next myth you are going to choose? I'm okay, asking okay. you because many myths are not known to people. And okay. I was trying to write uh, some stories from Nishetas. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. they are very interesting stories, could be used as a myth. But I'm writing as a story only. But I okay. stop in between. But I feel that those things will be, ha have a very, will be useful for the poets like you, who can take new myths again and again. Yeah. So, this is wonderful work. So what is your next OK, I would I love to read your stories. First of all, please send in your stories. I would love to go through them. There is so much to learn from you, Ratiti. Uh, yes. OK, so in 2020, uh, my poetry collection came, Selected Poems of Nandini Sahu, where I have taken uh, important poems from all my seven poetry collections in the past. And also a lot of new poems are there. Selected Poems of Nandini Sahu was published by Sinorina Publication last year. And now two poetry collections are under publication. I'm working on them. Uh, one is uh, a spring series. A, lo a lot of, you know, for the first time I have written some romantic poems. I, I hardly ever wrote romantic poems. All my poems are basically issue-based, social issues, women's issues, children's issues, and the masculinity studies and all that. So I always wrote very serious poetry, definitely. But this spring collection, spring series is coming with a lot of romantic poems. And uh, I'm using a very typical ly lyrical rhyme scheme, very lyrical poems. It's coming out maybe sometime this year. And another poetry book uh, is coming out. Now you can again ask me questions on that. The name of the book is Karn. So I have deconstructed the character Karn from the Mahabharat. And I read a lot of masculinity studies. Again, I am teaching masculinity studies in my theory classrooms. And uh, uh, so, uh, so the character Karn, the making of Karn, in the making of the masculine Karn, the contribution of a lot of women characters. What made Kern what he is? Contribution of Kunti, who gave birth to him. So his do Kunti gave birth to him and deserted him. So what came out of that? And the responsibility of Kunti in creating Kern kind of a character, a very powerful character. And Draupadi rejected him. She did not even allow him to take the mm -hmm. test, which you, he could have actually married her. But she said, I will never marry a Sutputra. So he was not allowed to participate in the competition in her swimmer. So how in the making of Karna, the character, the strong, bold character, I won't say very optimistic character because he had his complexities. He's one of the most complex characters in Indian mythology and in Indian you know, uh, uh, popular imagination. So I have tried to decode the character Karna and I have tried to think like a man. So being a woman, an eco-feminist myself, Thinking like a man was really challenging for me. I kept on thinking and thinking about Karna. In this situation, what Nandini would have thought as a woman, what Karna would have thought as a man. And I channelized myself into Karna's character with a lot of empathy and commitment, social commitment, I would say. So that complete book is coming out and it's written in Champu format. Champu, oh. 
it's prose poetry and i think that will be the first uh, ever indian english poetry collection in champu that's what i am given to understand i don't know if anyone has written a complete book in champu and i am using tripadi and saptapadi tripadi is every third syllable is rhymed saptapadi is every seventh syllable is rhymed it was very difficult to write tripadi so in the first two cantos i followed tripadi then i switched over to saptapadi so it's a very floral prose poetry when you read it you feel like you are flowing in water flowing in sea in the sea water and it's it's a running stream kind of a poem and i just love that poem i am just waiting to see it in print uh, the 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 poems are completed a long introduction has been written by me and also some very important famous contemporary poets have written brief you know about uh, that poem poetry book kern so these two are under publication spring series all romantic poems Kern, a poem of masculinity studies, again using myth as metaphor. So once they are published, I'm sure to send you copies for your uh, comments because you are a very sensitive reader, and I can see that the kind of sensitive work you have been doing and contributing to Indian poetry is unparalleled. So I would love to take your comments, Ratidhi. Yeah. Uh, I just uh, want to ask that Champu ka we we call in Sanskrit. Do, uh, does it uh, have a meaning in a uh, Odisha? Is it a uh, prose poetry? Because yeah, prose poetry. It, is it in Odisha? Odisha? Uh, no, it's used all, use all over India. I was just doing some Google search. So many other states also use Champu poetry. No, but Champu. In Indian English actually, poetry, there are no no uh, Champu poems. No, no Champu kavya is a is a kind of uh, literature uh, literature in Sanskrit, like mm-hmm. Mahakavya. Kavya mm-hmm. and Champu mm-hmm. Kavya. Champu Kavya means, as you say, the three lines, seven lines, small, small poetry, small poetry. Mm-hmm. Because Kavya is always poetry. And so, mm-hmm. uh, so in Sanskrit, actually, Champu Kavya we use it. it. So it means the Google yeah. is using something. Is <laughs> but Sanskrit. This is a Sanskrit style. Mm-hmm. This Champu Kavya is uh, basically Sanskrit because those days, first mm-hmm. Mahakavya. Most of the great writers like to write on in a in a Mahakavya way. Then, uh, 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 then Kavya like Kalidas and uh, Shudra and all, which is mix of the prose and poetry, mm-hmm. and then it comes like a Champu Kavya. Champu Kavya means right. very small, very small uh, uh, chandas are there, is, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, that is called Champu Kavya. So okay. that is in Sanskrit. So I do not know what how, in with what meaning it is, but it is good that. Uh, you are using that word, and that is you. You again. You are using that metaphor, Champu Kavya, in English, which is also good. And uh, of course, uh, Karn is uh, the character which should be used, uh, uh, and uh, we should be recreate and create in many ways. And what you say that is spring poetry, that is also Kalidas. You know that Ritu Samhar, the yeah. the the six uh, six seasons, and they are love poetry. So yeah, they are, uh, beautiful. Uh, so it's better. Uh, you are doing a great work, uh, Mandini. And, uh, I'm trying to do. Yeah, I'm trying yeah. to contribute to yeah. and focus. Yeah, so and, uh, huh, yeah, yeah. yeah but uh, because what you are doing in in your idea, your own way, that is also very important, and it is uh, in a way enriching uh, literature, uh, other language, same time. Uh, yeah. Giving your ideology, India, uh, Indian ideology, uh, to the Western world. So these yeah. both way, the, you are doing wonderful work. Uh, thank you very much for coming to this uh, Kritya uh, talk, and it was nice to talk to you. Uh, I, yeah. I'm sure that uh, our uh, audience will also, because nobody asked question. I was expecting. But anyway, they will ask question tomorrow to your classroom. Yes. <laughs> so I'm sure. <laughs> so, yes, yes. thank you very much. Yes. Thank you so thank much for inviting me. Wonderful coming co- discussing this. Okay.